Okay, I think we ought to um, ought to start. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar, the East of England Global Health Conference, uh, part one of two parts. So the next one is on the 19th of November. And um, the origin of this is that we had a conference booked in March, which because of the pandemic uh, was postponed. And as the pandemic has uh, continued, um, we've decided to put on the original conference in two parts. And today is the first part, uh, which is gonna be focusing particularly on primary care and public health. Um, and then we've got the second part of the conference on the 19th of November. Uh, the point about these conferences to, is the collaboration for impact. And this is to try and spread the good news about the Cambridge Global Health Partnership across the East of England. So we welcome, very much welcome participants from outside the immediate Cambridge environment. And um, the focus really is on how we spread the good news about public health globally. And also during this morning's conference, talk a bit about the new interdisciplinary research center in Cambridge, on, which will a great opportunity for, to influence that. So if I can just show the second slide, please. So again, thanks for joining. Um, and I'm presuming that most participants have come through the conference portal. And uh, we're very keen to spread the output of this conference on Twitter. So the conference hashtag is hash EOE Global Health as shown. So please start to um, tweet and encourage people to participate and join in. And any queries, uh, there is a chat box which uh, will provide technical support if you're having difficulty uh, seeing the screen or hearing properly. So hopefully that will be um, the helpful way in for you. Can I see the next slide? And as I just mentioned, uh, the focus this morning is on primary care and public health. Um, I myself was a GP for 10 years and vocationally trained GP, then went into public health, becoming director of public health. And I've always felt that there is an important collaboration between what primary care does and what public health does. And today's session is to try and explore some of those dimensions. Um, and um, that's, that's uh, the focus for today. So we're also wanting to um, share the slides to uh, get the message out more broadly and there we've got an sort of innovative uh, system of developing a mural for this conference and also the conference on the 19th uh, to try and capture some of the outputs that we would get in a normal face-to-face uh, -face conference such as you know putting up posters and um, comments on the conference so we're trying to capture those through a mural and I just wanted to um, share the purpose of the mural and how you participate in the mural um, and ask uh, Susie Watson to uh, explain that for us um, if she is ready. So can yeah. Susie join us now? Yep, I'm here, Tony. And if you stop sharing, I will share my screen. There we go. And uh, I am here to introduce Mural, which is basically a collaborative virtual whiteboarding space where you can contribute throughout the conference. Ideally, you'll join Mural collaborations via a browser window on a PC or laptop. And not to worry, if you've come via a phone or a tablet, there'll be plenty of time to contribute to Mural. And we'll have three different ways to contribute. And I'm gonna run through that briefly, but I wanted you to know that you have plenty of time. We'll have the, these three murals available for you and um, they will be in the chat windows as well as in the participant po portal. So you'll have easy access to them. And there are a number of easy ways to contribute, but the, the fastest is to just add post-its. 
the CGHP team has put together a video to teach you about easily using Mural, and I'll also be available during the break to help answer any questions or go through any of those tips if you missed the video on the participant portal. I won't be going through that right now because I just want to give you an overview of how to use Mural and how to contribute during this conference. So what we'll be doing is you'll receive a link in the Zoom chat, and then that link will be put into a tab and later you'll be um, asked to contribute. So for example, in an equitable partnership activity um, that happens in at 11, there will be an opportunity to find instructions on that mural and add post-its around the barriers and supports to the activity that will be explained. Um, you will also have an opportunity to contribute to an East of England global health landscape. This landscape was developed by a cross-functional team, and it was an attempt to gather information and begin conversations. It's by no means comprehensive. The first step in this was looking at some of the Cambridge initiatives. And we've added these initiatives with links to those. So the University of Cambridge initiatives and the Interdisciplinary Research Center and Strategic Research Initiatives are on the top. And on the right hand side, there are other global health related networks and organizations. Our hope is that we can build on that and add not only your initiatives and organizations to this map, but also get a global perspective around initiatives that relate to Cambridge so that we have the opportunity to build links between those. So for example, CGHP um, saw the Margaret Anstey Center for Global Health on this map and noticed that their partner the Rama Foundation was also working in India. And so they linked and alerted the Rama Foundation um, with the India-UK Development Partnership for Forum, which is also hosted by the Margaret Anstey Center for Global Health. It's these types of links that we're hoping to build and the instructions for adding to these links are on the top of the map. And so if you go to this map and you've already learned how to add a post-it and move around in Mural, feel free to add in your initiative if it's not already on the map and where you're partnering globally so that everyone has more visibility to the overall landscape in East of England Global Health. The third way you can contribute at the conference will be at the end of the conference, I'll be capturing throughout all of the themes and insights in this mural, and you'll have an opportunity to participate post the 19th and add anything we've missed. So our hope all the way through this conference is that you'll go to the participant portal to get quick tips and come to the break if you have any questions i'll help with any technical information that you need and ideally have fun collaborating and adding in your thoughts during this east of england global health conference I look forward to seeing you at the break and feel free to practice on this mural that we've been using at this um, URL um, below or in the Zoom um, as shared earlier. I look forward to seeing your contributions. Thank you. Tony, back to you. Thank you very much, Susie, for that and uh, encourage people to participate in the mural, um, which we will be doing throughout today and then again on the 19th of November. 
Okay, so um, at the beginning, I said that um, while this conference is uh, obviously about global health generally and how we can develop that further in East of England, the focus this morning is on primary care and public health. And our keynote speaker I'm pleased to introduce is Professor Amanda Howe. And at the beginning, I said that we were reaching out from the Cambridge Global Health Partnership to other parts of East Anglia and Amanda is clinical professor of primary care at the University of East Anglia. Uh, she um, did start training in medicine in Cambridge, so she knows Cambridge well, uh, but she's currently uh, president of the Royal College of GPs and she's past president of the World Organization for Family Doctors, um, which she was between 2016 and 18. Uh, so she um, is a very experienced uh, GP, uh, academic, uh, global leader in primary care. Started her career actually having qualified in Sheffield and was a GP in Sheffield and worked for Sheffield University as a clinical lecturer. And then she became a foundation professor at UEA when they were developing the medical school there. And that's where she's been ever since. And I don't know quite how she does it, but she maintains uh, her work as a part-time GP as well as an academic and performing her role in the Royal College of GPs. And if one wants to have a really good insight into um, Amanda and her journey, um, I would recommend a Royal College of GPs uh, YouTube. It's only about five minutes long, called Liberty, Luck, Leadership, Loss and Love. And she produced this in June during the um, pandemic, this pandemic, and I think reflects on her pathway uh, from her uh, school vocation to become a, a doctor, uh, her, her interest in the social psychological parts of um, medicine, her determination to become a GP, and then her wish to teach students and encourage young doctors to look to primary care as a future career opportunity. So that's a, a very short YouTube, which she speaks about liberty, luck, leadership, loss and love. So without further ado, I'd like to um, allow Amanda to give her keynote speech. So enjoy, thank you. Well, Greetings colleagues, I'm Amanda Howe. I'm the Professor of Primary Care at the University of East Anglia, also current officer of the Royal College of GPs and previously uh, the president of the World Organization of Family Doctors, which is known as Wonka. And I'm very happy and proud to have been asked to give you a keynote on the first of your sessions. So thanks to Tony Jewell, Arthur Hibble and others who've invited me for this. And I hope the conference goes really well. Obviously in the circumstances, I'd love to be with you in person, but it's just not possible. But anyway, great to share. And I look forward to doing the Q's and A's. Now, let me just share my screen so that I can show you my slides. There we go. So you've asked me to talk about global primary care and how it relates to the public health challenges of our time. As I was thinking about this, I thought I'd slightly change it because I think it's more about what it needs, what primary care actually needs to help it meet public health challenges. And I'm going to reflect on the global picture, talk particularly about some of the things that have been highlighted by COVID and then talk about ways forward, particularly perhaps relevant for us here in the UK at this time, but also relevant to other countries too, I think. So a few definitions. What is primary care? Well, WHO have defined it as first contact, accessible, continued, comprehensive and coordinated care, accessible at the time of need with continuity over the long term health of the person rather than just on the disease episode or illness episode. A range of services common to the common problems of the population so that 
many different needs can be met in one place or by one clinic or one team. And the role of coordination in bringing other referrals, investigations, other specialist opinions back into the context of that person's ongoing care. And in terms of why it matters, so again, WHO have said, and this was in the Astana Declaration, which mirrored the Alma Ata Declaration of much longer ago, but Astana was not 2018. Strengthening primary health care is the most inclusive, effective and efficient approach to enhancing people's physical and mental health, as well as their social well-being. A cornerstone of a sustainable health system for universal health coverage and relating to the sustainable development goals. So the WHO have come round to understanding that primary care is essential to meeting the needs of populations, and that includes some aspects of public health. So when you dig down into that, you say, well, OK, so who needs to collaborate for that actually to work? You know, where does primary care sit in the greater picture of things and who needs to understand and invest in its function? Broadly speaking, you know, governments and societies have got to agree with this. The system's got to work systematically to prioritise and protect people's health and well-being, both at an individual level and at a population health level. And that's got to be reflected in strong, coherent health systems in national legislation and investment. So if you like, you know, poor strategic planning or situations that keep changing from one government to another or one year to another or even every six months to another just doesn't work for a comprehensive, coordinated approach to healthcare. The health system itself, the parts have got to work together. So primary healthcare, secondary and tertiary care, if you have public and private sectors, which many countries do, they need to be able to work together rather than separately to underpin a common goal of healthcare. And similarly, the staff and those who train them need to be able to work together collaboratively rather than in competition or in a silo. And then those other sectors as well that underpin societal health. So. You've got to have the infrastructure that protects us. You've got to have the economy supporting healthcare. You've got to have the culture, a culture that empowers individuals and communities to attain health, maintain health, and enhance health and well being wherever possible. Prevent if you can, cure if not, care always. And that, again, is pr primary care is just one part of the system that produces and protects health, as we know. And so that means that all the partners and all the stakeholders involved with everything that affects health need to be aligned and to actually work together. And that is much easier said than done. We need the public to be on side, the community to be on side, you know, whether we're talking lifestyle, um, lifestyle risks versus exercise, healthy eating and so on. Of course, we need the public to be on side as well. And I'm sure by now you're thinking, yeah, I heard that all before. But it's true. If you don't have that multi-sectoral integration with strategic alignment and programmes that support health and health care over time, including primary care as an effective system, you know, you're not going to win. And if you want to read more, the OECD report really uh, is very interesting and gives a lot of detail about what makes health systems work. Now, if you are interested in the picture worldwide, there's enormous variation. So if you look in different countries, the workforce may look quite different. Who is in the workforce, how they're trained, what they can do at different levels, the role of doctors, nurses, healthcare assistants in different settings may be very different from what, for example, we know here in the UK. 
what the service provides. So I've been to countries where primary care is very weak or very minimal, sometimes only focusing on acute walk-in care and emergencies. Other countries putting a lot more emphasis on prevention and screening and chronic disease management. So varies enormously. How the service is financed. So we talk about universal health coverage, but by no means all countries use tax or even insurance, national insurance policies to cover the population. And how the service is financed will determine what the population is covered for, what services they get for that cover, and how much of the care is free at the point of use versus having to pay upfront for something you need. And of course, that makes a huge difference to whether people will be proactive and accept preventive care. If they have to pay, they're likely to only pay when they're really ill, to put it crudely. But that's one of the problems with people service. And similarly, there's enormous variation in how such a service, a healthcare service anywhere, both the people and the infrastructure is maintained and refreshed, how the population engages with the service. So we are used to the registered list where you, you know, are registered with the practice over a period of time. But in many countries, that's not the case. And you people choose each time they're going for an episode of care, where they go, who they go to. And those clinics don't necessarily have any ownership of that relationship. And then people, it varies, you know, who enters and who leaves the workforce. And there's a lot of issues, particularly for general practice and primary care nursing around the status of primary care. A lot of countries see primary care as a low status option to work in. And you want to be in the big hospital, in the teaching hospital. And that affects recruitment. It affects retention. It affects capacity. And that's a very big challenge for a system that wants to invest in primary care. And similarly, actually, when you start to look for data, countries vary in what they collect. So it's hard to make comparisons on quality of care, um, needs of the service, where the needs were met, standards monitoring over time. And finally, of course, thinking globally, the situation varies in what the needs are. So a poor subsistence part of sub-Saharan Africa will have massive more massively more challenges in social determinants of health in you know the money that their governments can spend on health care and ultimately you know in the equity of health care that different parts of the population will get and so if you look at the inverse care law Julian Tudor Hart's famous law about you know, the people who are the least needy get most of the benefits. That's often true in across the globe, that the people who can least afford it actually get the least good health care. So big challenges, enormous variation. And even in our own um, system, some of the developed countries, it's not as straightforward as we might think. So I'm sure most of the audience will have criticisms of the current situation of the NHS and be acutely aware of some of its challenges and shortcomings. And I was intrigued to hear an academic colleague in Canada a few years ago talking about the Canadian health system. Now, Canada is a country I admire and the family doctors there, the hospital, you know, the care is good. But Prof Glazier was saying, you know, so if you look, there's a real mismatch between what happens in primary care and what happens in the hospital side. The budgets are separate. We're working in silos. The visibility of primary care physicians in terms of monitoring, accountability, support, governance, teamwork is, is weak compared to the people who are working in hospitals. A lot of it was fee-for-service, a lot of it was solo practice, and, you know, the challenges in Canada, and then 14 different states. And so, you know, even in a developed country, the challenges of making a coherent, coordinated, equitable healthcare system are considerable for the politicians and the strategists and for the people. So your question, 
what does primary what does global primary care do to meet the public health challenges well i've seen some amazing examples just to name a few the bavans system in iran where community health workers have a registered number of one two or three villages where they're responsible for the vaccinations for doing a certain amount of acute care for giving public health advice. They are given the advice by the public health clinicians and they go out and share it with the leaders and do the education, check for the indoor fires, check the water supplies. And you can read about this in The Lancet a few years ago. Very interesting, very basic, very local comprehensive care model with your next reference point being the district health clinic up the road where the doctors and the nurse workforce start. The role of primary care in pandemics. This is my friend Atai Omarutu from Uganda when she was working in Liberia for one of the Ebola outbreaks. Uh, you know, brave woman, tremendously challenging work. Primary care clinicians are often very close to the community and they really understand how to get people on side. We've seen that with some of the community trust and trace schemes in the UK during COVID have worked really well because the community and the primary healthcare people were very close to each other. The Indigenous healthcare workers in uh, Australia, the Torres Islands and the, this community, again, prioritising working with the community, through the community to explain to people how to get the best out of their healthcare and how to embrace the modern technologies like vaccination or contraception or whatever preventive screening approaches are fit for purpose in a modern society, but to bring people on and to give them those opportunities. A bit closer to home, I'm sure many of you have heard about the Deep End Initiative, now going around the United Kingdom, but originally starting in Scotland, trying to ensure that areas of deprivation actually had sustainable workforce in primary care to address the enormous health needs of those populations by support, peer review and um, access for patients. So the Deep End Initiative, an amazing example of how to meet public health challenges through innovation in primary care. And another good example in England, the Frome practice in Somerset and their model of enhanced primary care. I mean, you, people are talking about social prescribing. I mean, Frome's got an amazing model of community outreach, cross-sectoral working, uh, very big emphasis on sustainability and greener climate, uh, health work. And so that's a really good example of a primary care team reaching out to address many of the public health challenges. And we can't not talk about COVID, can we? So if you start thinking, well, I wonder if the systems that are strong primary health care around the world actually help to protect people against COVID. We did some work on this across Wonka in the earlier months of the, of the pandemic. And the short answer was no. So surveying different countries and looking at the mortality data and the indicators that recognize a strong primary healthcare system, there was no correlation. And the main correlation was with restriction on movement, um, some evidence about access to protective equip personal equipment and really active testing regimes very early on and contact tracing. So the public health measures in this situation for COVID were paramount and primary care was not necessarily the main source or root of those. But having said that, of course, primary care has played an enormous role in the pandemic in most countries, keeping patients safe and staff safe where possible, continuing to look after people for other conditions, 
because health needs didn't go away just because of COVID, giving active advice to the vulnerable, particularly those who had to shield how to look after themselves, what was okay, what wasn't, and educating people as well as trying to help people to cope with the anxiety. And now, of course, we're moving into the phase where you know, maybe there is potential for us to be part of the testing system. Certainly, if there's a vaccine, I'm sure primary care will have to be involved at some level. And the capacity of primary care to support public health initiatives, I think, is crucial for the long term, not just around COVID. But this is a point that I now want to discuss because we talked already about strong and weak systems. But if you want primary care to be actively involved in public health initiatives, it's got to have the capacity to do that. And example, you know, if you suddenly say, right, your primary care team's got to give the entire population the new COVID vaccine, I mean, that's going to need some capacity challenge, isn't it? It's going to need some planning. We're going to have to look at how to do that. So if there is a role for primary care, we've got to have the capacity to play those roles. And even on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, actually releasing clinicians to go to a multi-sectoral meeting about, you know, community interventions, it takes time, it takes energy. And if you haven't got the capacity in the practice, it's difficult to get involved in those bigger picture initiatives. So what's needed now? I think many countries around the world do still show a bias towards the hospital sector. This is a long-standing pattern and we need to actively address it, constantly address it. Governments need to understand that if left to its own devices, the costs of the acute sector drift up and you've got to direct resources actively into primary care. New models of care. As I said, the small isolated practice may not be able to be very effective in public health initiatives. If we work across the sectors, if we work together at scale across communities and we free up capacity, not necessarily from every practice, but from some practices to take part in community level initiatives and in an integrated way, then we've actually got a chance of doing more around population health, more around early prevention and community level interventions than we have if we just try to do it in our own little patch. And the examples, particularly link workers, community link workers, having public health leads in localities, the primary care networks in the UK are now going to look at this and that's a really important agenda for them. Further investment, the Astana Declaration asked for it. That is, of course, you know, a huge, crucial challenge. If you don't invest, you can't expand. And advocacy. So having the people with the evidence and the voices at the table to convince policymakers and providers about the changes that are needed in payment systems and in teams, you know, persuading them that it's actually the investment's worth it because it will cost less in the longer run. It is feasible, the effort will pay off, and that the successes have already been demonstrated in many parts of the world. So actually that advocacy, I think, is always needed, and it's certainly needed now on behalf of primary care, worldwide, country level, regionally, professional network level like the college. Those bodies really need to give voice to the needs of primary care. And of course, also to focus not only on resources per se, but to make sure they get to the places that need them most. So patterns of underinvestment in the workforce actually need to be redressed, like the Deep End Initiative was one example. So the global movement to strengthen primary health care does really matter. And the alliance under the Astana Declaration does really matter more than ever now because of COVID, because so many economies have taken a huge hit. And behind that will become societal angst, people going out of jobs, less money, less well-being, psychological stresses, 
less healthy lifestyles, you know, now more than ever, we're going to need to strengthen and support primary care because we're the ones who work with those people all the time. And if we need non-medical interventions, the social prescribing models, as in Froome, as in the Bavars, then, you know, we need the capacity to put our heads above the parapet and engage with those public health initiatives. Not all of us, not every day, because most of us are doing patient care most of the time, but some of us to address it at that kind of level. So thank you very much. I hope that's helpful and interesting, and I look forward to joining you for the Q's and A's. Thanks. Good. Thank you very much indeed, Amanda. Um, just checking that I'm getting back on the screen, uh, Fiona. And also whether Amanda's been able to join us. I think um, I think she has. So we're just going to try and get the technical side sorted here. Yeah, I think I'm unmuted, Tony. Is that right? Okay. That's great, Amanda. Thank Good. you very much for joining. Okay. And as I said at the awesome. introduction, that um, you are working as a GP this morning. So uh, yeah. you're wearing lots of hats, uh, president of the Royal College of GPs, you know, academic at UEA, and also continuing to work as a GP. So well done. Thanks. Thank uh, so we really enjoyed your talk and we've got some questions already being flagged up by participants. Um, so I think I'd like to um, refer to the first one, really, which is asking about universal health coverage um, and uh, the role that um, an integrated system from your experience with uh, global primary care and realising the sustainable development goals include universal health health coverage and what you feel about the things that enable an integrated health system and those that uh, work against that and what, what would be your experience in trying to develop universal health coverage including primary care? It's, it's a complex area and in my slides in my talk I was trying to convey the sort of stacking up of the deal that policymakers have to be persuaded and finance models have to add it up, but I'll try and answer it um, simply. And then I think, you know, other colleagues will look into it further if they're interested in this. I think one of the drivers is to get a pooled funding model. So either you pay for uh, the health service from tax or from some sort of pooled insurance. As long as a system, um, is left as fee for service, it tends to disintegrate and fragment. So in terms of the business models, there's a big challenge to bring the different providers and sectors together, but the countries that have done it to say, this is the um, package of care that we want to offer people, and we're going to do it through some sort of pooled funding model where they put in the money through tax or insurance, but then they get the service free at the point of view. So that's one driver. And then the second part of developing integration is to have that vision that the first level of care is held by a common team for the purposes of prevention screening first assessment of new acute symptoms, ongoing chronic disease management, and indeed other aspects of care where appropriate, because that then integrates the patient care at that first level. And then also it acts as the gatekeeper or the pathfinder for the referrals, because left to themselves, of course, a patient with new abdominal pain, how do I know if it's gynecological or surgical or medical or indeed psychosomatic? So the, the, once you've got that vision of why UHC matters, I think designing the health system to integrate around the patient then becomes if you like, a logical consequence. And then the business investment has to stack up behind that. And some of that is people being persuaded, as I said, that it's actually cost effective, but that's the evidence that has emerged in the literatures and which I think WHO is now 
trying to persuade governments to really take notice of. So that's my start. What do you think, Tony? Yes, well, I'm absolutely right. And uh, sometimes people confuse primary care with being a general medical practitioner. And I think your point about primary point of access with the sort of multidisciplinary team uh, with many functions is a point well made, because I think many people working globally will see different forms of primary care. And uh, I think that's an important point. Um, we haven't got a huge amount of time, so I'm quite keen to get the panelists' questions in. So we're going to flick over to, um, I think during your talk, you referred to the COVID study um, and the role that primary care was seen globally to either make a difference or not. And uh, the outcome you suggested was the primary care actually at this point in time didn't make a huge amount of difference in controlling COVID. Um, so the, the question really was, um, you know, why do you think that was? And um, yeah. just, just, just spell that out, because obviously people still don't. Yeah, well, please it. have a look at the article, and you know, then you can get what information detail there was. But I think this was done as a survey in the first four months of COVID. And the responses of people who leading family medicine organizations in a country, for example, were then compared with uh, indicators of strength of healthcare system, which is an OECD um, framework that researchers can use. And I think, you know, what the colleague said in the question, what I said on the slide was that it appeared to be that actually the spread was limited much more quickly in countries who took these very strong public health measures that weren't necessarily being led in or through primary healthcare systems. Now, that isn't at all to say that we in primary care or my colleagues around the world weren't doing anything, but it was that, you know, break up the crowds, get the cover onto the faces, get the testing and the contact tracing done, and it, it appeared that that in that early period was the thing that was making the difference. And even in our country, you know, we know that those sort of measures are not something that even the most public health orientated GP will be leading, will be encouraging it in our population and our staff. But most of the implementation of that was done by government level and other agencies, I think was the short of the you know, the findings, but it was a very early study and it, you know, limited, if you like, by methodological access. So I'm, I think this will still be an emergent picture. And of course, there was a lot we don't know. I mean, many of the, most, the countries with the weakest healthcare systems, I'm sure we weren't recording all the cases early on. So there were, there were lots of, you know, invisible issues that maybe also made a difference. Thank you. So, um, I mean, certainly in this country, I think primary care, many of us have been asking for greater collaboration, even at this stage. But mm, uh, mm. you can see with the flu vaccination programme, the GPs play a very important part. And certainly the beginning of COVID here, I think the care home um, support to care homes in particular and the infection prevention control. Uh, primary care teams have a very important yeah. role in that. Mm. So and I'm, I'm sure with the you know, clinically extremely vulnerable group, uh, prior shielded group. Again, GPs are the people that hold the records and understand the family situation that many of those patients exist in. So I, th I think it'll come, it'll come more prominent as yeah. we go on. Yes. Thank you for that. And I just um, wanted to get in another uh, question from the participants. And this is really about, I think many of us, um, you know, over time, including me, Alma Arta Declaration 1978, you know, health for all by the year 2000. And now we've got universal you know, health coverage. Um, there's a certain sense, and I think Margaret Chan said it, didn't it, now more than ever. And many of us who, as it were, believe in primary care and public health and the importance of that for uh, sustainable health development globally, um, do feel a little bit uh, defensive when people say, well, you know, what happened after 78? What mm. happened after 2000? Um, you know, now we are again trying to push this forward. So, I mean, what are your reflections on that? And um, yeah, 
Yes, I agree. Your colleague who's put the comment on and says, you know, does this tell us about the cyclical nature of health policies? I don't think it has to be cyclical. I think there was a, there is still this huge debate between the free market model and the, you know, politically systematic model for a healthcare system and the balance between the two. And yes, I'm sure that was caught up in the cycle of leadership and policies. And, you know, it's quite sad 40, 50 years on that we're still facing the same dilemmas around the world. So I think there is a sense of deja vu, but I would, I think the people who were on the stage at Astana were trying to do was to say, let's bring this round and stabilize it in before another 50 years so that people aren't sitting and saying, well, we said that then, but we haven't really progressed it. Um, so cyclical maybe, I prefer to hope that it was moving together in a good direction. Now, one other colleagues asked about where good practice gets shared. And the short answer is, I think that's really important too. So if you're in the Africa region, your dilemmas may be very different from the European region. And so the regional WHO offices will share, but we also try, you know, primary care, there have been some really good cross country networks. Prima Famed was one that people may have heard of in sub-Saharan Africa, where people really try to bring countries together to share good practice and what was working for them so that they could then advocate back in their own countries to say, well, look, Rwanda's doing this, and why can't we do that? They're not a rich country, blah, blah, blah. So I think sharing good practice in your, in, with countries that have things in common is also a really important way forward because the Astana and the Almaty Declaration, very high level, we've got to make it real on the ground in our own places. And one of your points made in the presentation was actually about inequalities that exist even in mm -hmm. advanced, so-called and more advanced developed countries. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Australian Aboriginal health might be an example. Yeah. And we have it in, in our country. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that public health has to always advocate for is trying to reduce health inequalities. And I guess that thinking globally is, is one of the issues, isn't it? Yes, and the RCGP has taken as one of its, you know, priorities, particularly informed by the pandemic, the need to further develop the public health and community health function. So that again, in a feasible way, but an effective way, because I became a GP to get upstream of people getting sick, really sick, but I'm still downstream of the societal inequities that cause people to get ill in the first place. And, yes. you know, we've got to work together to change that in my view. I, th I think, and fi finally, really, I just wanted to, you know, bring in your comment about um, Julian Tudor Hart. Uh, yeah, I think you mentioned Julian and, um, you know, many people um, forget when he talks about the inverse care law that actually says, you know, equity is harder in market economies. And I think you've made the point about, um, you know, the economic structures within different societies. And uh, his point, you always used to say to me, um, you know, people always forget that. They quote the first part of the sentence about the inverse care law, and then they forget to say that it's much harder to get equity within, um, you know, free market economies. And I think you started to talk about global health yes. and how you finance primary care and yeah. a little bit like America with affordable. And you know. indeed the first question going back to the business model, I didn't say it explicitly, but again, one of the challenges that can then lead to a solution is if you can get the public and the private sectors in a country actually working together to provide integrated care rather than being in competition, that yeah. can shift the curve quite a lot as well because the private market still has customers yes. but they're actually working to the package of care that everybody needs and adding capacity and I've seen that in a few um, systems elsewhere in the world as a business model that's really moved things on. Yes. Good I think we've 
probably got to come to the end, but just the final plug before we leave Julian uh, Tudor Hart was just because this is public health and primary care, just to remind people that he worked as an epidemiologist with the MRC epidemiology unit in Cardiff with Cochrane, Archie Cochrane. Uh, and then he went into becoming a single-handed GP in Glencorig, a coal mining village. And uh, all the time, Cochrane used to come and say, Julian, why have you done this? Why have you done this? Because he was working in a ramshackled old hut in a, a mining village where the mine was running down. And uh, But nevertheless, his epidemiological output, uh, he came from a good stable, you know, Archie Cochrane stable in MRC unit in Cardiff. So, um, so that's an example of public health and primary care. And I think, Amanda, you were also exhibiting the same connection with your interests in, uh, you know, social factors in disease and so on. So thank you very much for giving us your keynote today. Um, you know, tick the box and uh, hopefully we can continue to work with UEA, yourself and colleagues in Norwich to develop, you know, our intention, which is to try and get global public health uh, partnership working in the east of England. So thank you very much indeed. Very welcome. Thank you all and have a great rest of the sessions. Okay. Thanks a lot, Amanda. Bye. Okay. We're moving on now to the next part of um, the conference. And I just want to introduce uh, Dr. Caroline Trotter, who's honorary epidemiologist at Public Health England, senior lecturer in epidemiology at the Department of Veterinary Medicine in Cambridge. And she's also been a, a consultant to WHO with a particular interest in vaccination and immunization. So, Caroline, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tony. Um, and thank you for the invitation uh, to speak at this, at this conference. Um, hopefully you can see my, see my screen now. Um, so as Tony mentioned, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. I focus my research on vaccine preventable diseases. Um, and the other hat I wear is as director of Cambridge Africa, which is a university program that supports African researchers and promotes mutually beneficial collaborations and equitable partnerships between Africa and Cambridge. Um, and I think hopefully we'll come back to um, some more about Cambridge Africa since the theme of this uh, conference is collaboration for impact. Um, with the blessing of the organisers, I just wanted to start my talk by remembering my uh, good friend and colleague, Amit Bassin, who passed away unexpectedly in June this year. He was the Cambridge Africa programme manager and a key member of the global health community. He was part of the original East of England Global Health Conference working group. And throughout his career, um, much of which was spent at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, he made a really impressive contribution to capacity development for African science and scientific management. He was only with us at Cambridge Africa for, for a short time, but really um, everyone who met him would, would recognise um, that one of his outstanding qualities was his you know, ability to make friends and to make work fun. And I think it would be an excellent tribute to Amit if we could build on his example and his extraordinary energy and commitment to global health partnerships and collaboration. Um, through today and I'm through to the future. Okay, so the main part of my talk um, is to introduce a new initiative from the University of Cambridge. Um, Cambridge Public Health is a new interdisciplinary research centre, um, which will build on the successes of both the Cambridge Institute of Public Health, led by Carol Brain for many years, and Public Health at Cambridge Network. Um, and the idea of this IRC is to extend out to the wider university uh, to generate a powerful response to address global challenges to population, population health and well-being. Um, it's led by Carol Brain, who's here today, uh, and John Clarkson. I think it's, it's fantastic that, that global health, as you can see in, in the diagram, is one of the key themes of this new centre. Um, and I just want to spend uh, the rest of my talk thinking about what centre will do, what the uh, feed global health theme will do. Um, we don't have uh, enormous resources to run this global health theme, so what we wanted to really concentrate on um, is, is connecting projects, people, partners um, and resources to identify identified needs. We want to be able to amplify what's going on, we want to be able to amplify, amplify good practice 
um, look at successful research collaborations with partners in low and middle income countries and amplify research impact. Um, and they, th that particularly speaks to the theme of this conference. And we want to strengthen Cambridge's institutional knowledge and practice, um, as well as research capacity in low middle income country partner institutes. We also want to strengthen our internal and external communication. I think that could be viewed as, as one, one of the weaknesses in uh, um, global health in Cambridge, um, and potentially within the broader East of, region, East of England region, is that our external, uh, it's not so clear what's, what's going on um, both within Cambridge uh, and outside. Um, and that's one area we can really, we can really work on. The launch of, a, of the new website for the IRC will, will help with that, um, and that is due to um, be launched in December. So how will we work across the university? Obviously, Cambridge is a, is a complex place, um, and there are lots of things going on. So this is sort of a, a, a first pass at how we will work within, uh, with, the other, with the other structures across the university. So if we're the global health uh, theme of the Interdisciplinary Research Centre will also link with other relevant uh, interdisciplinary research centres, including Cambridge Infectious Diseases and other strategic research initiatives such as global, uh, Cambridge Global Challenges and other networks. We will partner with colleges who have their own global health hubs. Um, we have uh, Hughes Hall and Wolfson in particular who are um, setting up new initiatives in global health. We will work with research projects, research groups and units who have external funding across the university. There are examples of, of some of these projects being showcased uh, through the conference um, today and on the 19th. Um, and we'll work with the university central offices. Uh, Rue has a, the research operations office has a global health research manager, Rose Eichenberger, who will be talking um, on the 19th. Um, we'll also work with the global health governance team and the strategic partnerships office. So we're not trying to not trying to duplicate anything that's going on. It's trying to connect it um, and amplify where necessary. Um, I'm one of the theme leaders, but there are three of us, um, both of whom are here today and speaking in the next, uh, Stephen speaking in, in this session uh, and is on the panel and Ross is leading the panel discussion later. Um, we're all very happy to, uh, to hear your ideas um, for what the global health theme should be doing. Um, and We'll develop those through um, uh, through the course of the conference, and particularly through the use of, of mural. Susie introduced the global health landscape mural, and actually, while this is useful for everyone in the conference, we see it as a, as a particularly useful output or, or input into the um, uh, global health theme of the interdisciplinary research centre. So it's great; it'll be great to know what's going on throughout the region. Um, and who the partners are across the world. Um, so this global health uh, landscape sort of mapping exercise is going to be really helpful for seeing where, where the activity is going on, what the strengths are, um, uh, and, and sort of improving our knowledge of, of the whole picture across the east of England. The second element that uh, we would love your contribution for um, is on the equitable collaborations mural. Um, and we really want to understand from you what barriers are there to equitable collaborations um, and conversely in what factors enable equitable collaborations. Um, so if you can please contribute to this mural as well, then we may be able to identify some common themes and some identify some action points that we can take um, as the uh, global health theme of the, of the IRC again to help make better connections, to help amplify good practice um, and to learn from one another. Thank you very much for uh, listening to this talk. Um, I don't want to take too much time uh, speaking myself because we have um, a really fantastic lineup of speakers um, with a wonderful range of talks and that showcase a variety of research that's going on um, across Cambridge. I'm sharing my screen now. Thank you. Um, so our first speaker, um, is Dr. Sarah Steele. Uh, she's Deputy Director of the Intellectual Forum at Jesus College, Cambridge. Uh, and Sarah's research examines the interface of international relations, global health and law. So I invite Sarah to share your screen 
to start your talk. Hi all, hi. I have quite a limited period of time, so just let me situate a little bit um, some of my research, which is actually now in um, the Cambridge Public Health background as well. So I'm at Jesus College, but I'm also part-time in Cambridge Public Health, and I will be doing some teaching on this in the new MPhil, which has been mentioned in passing and various different aspects. I should also just start really quickly on the limited time that I have in thanking the collaboration that I have on the commercial determinants of health, which is actually part of a global um, conglomeration of people working. So I just want to acknowledge the partners that are working in Milan in Italy, in California and in Australia on this project in all of their forms. And you can contact me if you have interest in collaborating as well. But what we have worked on and what we're looking at is those multinational determinants of health of a commercial nature. So we're looking at these boundary spanning um, global and transnational determinants, specifically looking at the commercial determinants of health. And for some reason, my slides won't progress. So just give me a second to figure that out. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. So effectively, what I'm working on is picking up on then um, WHO Director General Margaret Chan's note that efforts to prevent non-communicable diseases go against many of the business interests of powerful economic operators where our research is situated is trying to understand those business interests and the power interface. So what we're looking at is where the selling of ultra processed foods, sugar sweetened drinks, alcohol, tobacco and other harmful products, how they've come to be this booming business, especially in low and middle income countries and more so than ever, but also in countries like the UK. What we're interested in looking at specifically is how profit driven diseases are really taking hold as some of the top killers. Of course, as you just heard in the talk, those economic interests and those economic impetuses that sit behind um, what our healthcare service has to kind of pick up as a burden um, are something that we need to focus on. And so particularly my research group is interested in looking at um, unhealthy commodities, industrial epidemics, and corporate practices that are harmful to health. Why are we doing this? Well, I'm sure you've all seen this kind of our world in data content. Many of you are aware of this in your professional practice. But what I want to point out is that in those top 10 killers, the causes of death annually, of course, we're going to see this change this year with COVID and various other factors. But across the last decade, in those top 10 killers, a lot of them have been caused by or driven by overconsumption of ultra processed foods and drinks, um, poor nutrient food, those sorts of things. And so what we see is around the world in the global context, in that boundary spanning kind of a way, is that poor diet is fueling the rise of unhealthy conditions. We're seeing serious health conditions like type two diabetes, cancer and cardiovascular disease, on the rise. And we're also seeing that this is playing out in the UK and quite critically, what we're seeing is this mirror around the world across low and middle income countries, as well as high income countries, that an increasing proportion of our calories are coming from ultra processed food and drinks. Now I use that term with some caution. If I had more time, I'd go into it. But what I wanna point out is that prepackaged processed foods that are ultra processed. So they contain a lot of additives, they contain a lot of preservatives, they contain artificial or sugar sweetened um, aspects to them. These things aren't raw foods, they aren't even minimally processed foods. We're not talking here about your standard bag of pasta, but we are talking about those increase in pre-packaged foods and drinks. And in the UK, we're really seeing this hammer home. Um, we're seeing huge increases in the annual turnover of 
restaurants. That, of course, may change this year. But we saw really with COVID that the recovery plan for our economy featured getting people into restaurants. It featured subsidizing these kinds of foods as well with people rushing to McDonald's and rushing to Greg's as soon as it opened. But we're also seeing it play out in terms of other kinds of sugar sweetened caloric impacts in our diet, like a lot of the coffees and lattes. I just want to kind of touch on the fact that when we look at ultra processed foods and when we look at the sugar sweetened beverage industry, while a lot of our research is centered on Coca-Cola and such, we're increasingly acknowledging that part of their um, portfolio are things like co Costa Coffee's take home lattes and things like that, as well as in store beverages, which comprise of a huge amount of sugar. There's in fact more sugar in the caramel latte in a can than there is in a whole whisper chocolate bar. And so many people don't think about drinking sugar in that way. And so we've been really focused on understanding the processes by which these entities that are marketing these products are informing or not informing the public, informing or not informing public policymakers, and also influencing the environment in which their foods are sold or their beverages are being sold. And so our team particularly tries to move to understand how these ultra processed foods and drinks come to be as prolific as continuously growing as we've acknowledged the obesity epidemic how have they taken hold and how are they not being regulated effectively and to understand that we have been using the food industry's own words so what we have done here specifically is search this big database which has millions and millions of industry documents much like was used around tobacco to try and understand the strategies. And what we find are a huge number of emails and a huge number of interactions between speakers and between um, different entities and actors, which tell us a lot about activities around advocacy. So emails like this that suggest how a Coca-Cola former executive is matching up people into a schools program. We see interactions where there are things like at the bottom where you're connecting people for dinners and such like that and getting people to conferences and we see in the financial documents that reveal in our studies that often those influences are concealed so we see coca-cola here if you look at the top left is funding an entity ilsi which then goes on to do these influential policy making activities. It doesn't declare itself as a lobby group, those sorts of interactions. And our papers all consider these and look at these agencies interacting with these third parties that conceal corporate influence and try and understand how that seeks to affect and impact on national guidelines, international activity at the WHO, and how really this is about product defense, not public health. And so that's really what we've been looking at are these kind of things where the food industry responds to attempts at effective regulation or effective public policy or public communication and science communication to try and thwart that through gaining positive influence at conferences by allowing planned campaigning and public relations endeavors and by pushing certain scientists to the fore through organizations like IFIC, the International Food Information Council, um, which purports to be a science communication body, but actually our documents suggest it's in fact a front group. And this is really what we've been looking at. We've been looking at contracts we found in these email documents about how they can manipulate and push scientists, especially young researchers in public health. And we've been building that forward. So really what our research has been about is about attempting to understand these activities and also kind of pushing the messaging and looking at how we can facilitate our young early career researchers to understand influence, guide our postdocs and do these sorts of things. But I'm sure with the limited amount of time we have, you've probably got some questions for me. So I'm really happy to kind of answer those quite quickly. Thank you very much, Sarah. That's uh, a really fascinating talk uh, and excellent research. Um, a, a question for you. Um, the COVID pandemic has highlighted the fine balance between the needs of public health versus the needs of people's uh, mental health. Um, for example, social distancing versus loneliness. Is there research looking at the balance between the ill effects of junk food 
um, and similar products versus people's desire for accessible, simple rewards and pleasures? So I think one of the things that we've been looking at is, um, so we haven't looked at the exact influence of COVID on that. What we've been interested in in one of our team's research points is looking at how parents have changed lunchboxes because it's quite intuitive to go, oh, it's safer to use something prepackaged, right? Like if it comes in a hermetically sealed thing, little Jimmy's not going to get COVID from it. Whereas if there's people preparing his food in school, we're more worried about that. And we actually did a survey of Cambridgeshire schools, um, of parents within the schools. We got quite a substantial response rate, which we're really happy about and we're about to publish. And what we found was that while lunchboxes continue to reflect those pre-packaged foods being present, it hasn't changed that much since the start of the pandemic. What actually shifted was schools offering hot cooked meals. And so if the schools were offering hot cooked healthful meals with vegetables on the plate, parents were inclined to send their kids to eat it rather than give them a box full of prepackaged foods. So part of what we're about and part of what we've been looking at, actually a lot of the existing rhetoric around obesogenic environments has defrayed this onto a personal choice and exercise basis. We say, know your BMI, engage in activity, choose more healthy foods. But what we've really seen in that research we've just done is, especially with childhood um, and school age provision, is if we at the top, if the government, the schools, the head teachers provide healthful alterna alternatives in school meals, they will come. It's not parents choosing the lunchbox full of unhealthy prepackaged foods for safety reasons, it's the lack of provision. And so that really harks to the fact that a lot of this comes down to public policy initiatives that guide us to do those kind of early years interventions. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, in the interest of time, we'll, we, we need to move on, but that was fascinating. Thank you very much. And I'm really happy to send a lot more clear. Seven minutes is kind of really quick, so I'm really yeah. happy to send more <laughs> to people if they want to email me. Um, my email address is ss775. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, if I could ask you to uh, stop sharing your screen and invite um, Professor Stephen Baker to give his talk. Um, Stephen is one of the co-chairs of the Global Health Beam. Um, he's a molecular microbiologist um, working in the Department of Medicine uh, in Cambridge. Um, previously, before coming to Cambridge, he researched enteric infections as part of the Welcome Africa Asia program in Vietnam. Um, so Steve, welcome. Okay, so you should be able to hear me. Uh, and you should be able to see my slides. Okay. okay. Yeah. So again, just to say that uh, seven minutes isn't a huge amount of time uh, to talk about exactly what we do here and what I'm interested in. Um, but I'll give you a quick whistle-stop tour uh, of how I got to this point and what I'm doing in Cambridge. Um, this is our shiny new building located on Cambridge Biomedical Campus. Uh, we're on the, the top floor of this um, and we have multiple researchers. We're trying to expand it a little bit, uh, focusing on kind of understanding both um, mechanisms of infection with bacteria and viruses, but also trying to do a little bit more translational research into how we take that information and try and develop new insights into the way we treat and prevent against infections. And um, this is a, you know, a big area. Uh, where the drug resistant bacteria come from, but also I've added on a, a little suffix to this of say on what next. So there's a lot of doom and gloom about drug resistance um, of which I think that I'm probably a key proponent of, of which I will highlight this is incredibly important and also, also slight worry, worrying, but actually then we need to start thinking about where we go from here and what next. So I spent a long time, 12 years working in Southeast Asia um, before I arrived in Cambridge. Uh, there's a, a circle which we all used to show for the purposes of grant applications of while we were working in Southeast Asia. I was located in Vietnam. This represents uh, about a three hour plane ride from anywhere in Singapore or, or Vietnam here. And this circle encompasses 
almost a third of the world, just over a third of the world's human population and half the world's animal population. So it's not surprising then that we see the emergence of lots of new weird and wonderful things in this particular area as highlighted really quite poignantly in the last year by COVID. Um, but also then the emergence of drug resistant bacteria. So why does this then happen? There are multiple potential drivers of this. A lot, many arguments about the way food is prepared, about hus husband, uh, animal husbandry, and also the use of antimicrobials in animal populations, allowing for the facilitation of development of drug resistant bacteria in the environment. But also then this kind of interaction, common interaction between humans and animals. This is a very famous photograph here from the H5N1 epidemic, which occurred in Vietnam in about 2005. And also then access to uh, antimicrobials. So I'm, I'm not really a social scientist, but we did a study looking at antimicrobial access in pharmacies in the city, in Ho Chi Minh City. This is ciprofloxacin. So if you were to go and ask your GP for some ciprofloxacin, you would have to go through various loopholes to probably get it and various tests. This is the ciprofloxacin that was available just by asking if we could buy ciprofloxacin in 25 different pharmacies that were located in two square kilometers and all of, all of them sold the ciprofloxacin in various doses and various, um, and various uh, manufacturers um, without any, any real insight to what we needed it for. Resulting then in this obvious issue, then this is a diagram of uh, an organism that is susceptible by these big zones and also resistant by these smaller zones around it to different antimicrobials. Now, then this may not seem a big problem with this particular organism, as we can see there are um, zones around the, these bacteria, which looks like they're susceptible. But the issue is then not only then are these organisms becoming resistant to everything, they're becoming resistant chiefly to oral antimicrobials which means when people get sick with these bacteria, they end up in hospitals and have to go on fairly extreme therapy requiring long-term hospitalization and long-term bacteria. Now, this is probably no longer a controversial statement depending on who you're talking to, uh, but almost all drug resistant bacteria originate in Asia and then spread incredibly quickly. So where I was in Southeast Asia, we often see the, the ripple effect of it coming across from other places, but the principal areas here really are located in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, where there's a huge density of human interaction and also large antimicrobial production and easy access, which appear to be creating the largest problem. And the results, um, as has been uh, um, shown before on multiple occasions, this is data from a site we're working in in Nepal, in, in a hospital in Kathmandu, multi-drug resistant organisms are resistant to three antimicrobial classes or more uh, associated with bloodstream infections between 1992 and 2014. Here, gram-negative organisms, gram-positive organisms, all increasing the proportion of bacteria that were expressing multi-drug resistance. And this is a really elegant graph displaying this in the middle. So the proportion of non-MDR organisms to non to MDR organisms originated from blood a period in the early 90s up until the turn of the century here where there was more non-MDR, a period where they both cracked each other and then really in the last two years this flick over where actually we have more multi-drug resistant organisms than non-multi-drug resistant organisms and if you're interested in listening what I've got to say I'm sure lots of you aren't but if you are then I've written various things about this highlighting why we need to think about this and why we need to do new things. So what's going on now just to labour the points this is a increasing problem so it's not the point now where these things happen and they just stop uh, we have this propensity to keep on making it worse we're in an arms race so every time an organism becomes resistant to something we have to treat it with something else there is a, an outbreak an ongoing outbreak of xdr typhoid fever in in pakistan this is resistant to almost all apart from one oral antimicrobial uh, and there is the need then for these people that do fail treatment to end up in hospitals. So this is already a problem, hence facilitating perhaps the uh, acceleration of, of typhoid vaccines in this area. But we've also more recently identified organisms that are thankfully at the moment unrelated or distantly related to this XDR outbreak. And these are resistant to azithromycin. Azithromycin is the last oral antimicrobial we have in this region for treating typhoid fever. So I'm not saying that this is going to be untreatable, but if these organisms cross over, which is highly likely that we have XDR typhoid with uh, azithromycin resistant, we have 
typhoid that can only be treated with injectable antimicrobials in hospital. Klebsiella, so we've done a lot of work on Klebsiella. Um, this is spreading again across Asia, uh, it, uh, often into the UK now also. We have this variant of hypervirulent Klebsiella, uh, which causes really aggressive invasive disease. Usually it's not drug resistant, but in India, we see the convergence of organisms that are resistant to third generation cephalosporins, but also carbapenems. And this is not just a single organism. This is occurring in multiple backgrounds by multiple mechanisms. And we appear to be driving this again by the use of broad spectrum antimicrobials, particularly in, hosp in hospitals and particularly again in South Asia. And this is really my last point. Um, then ciprofloxacin, we found that actually there's been an outbreak of ciprofloxacin resistant uh, Shigella, a disease that causes really aggressive uh, dysentery in children. Uh, ciprofloxacin is recommended WHO treatments. Not only then are these organisms now resistant to ciprofloxacin, but what we found then by acquisition of these various plasmids in specific lineages, if you treat these organisms with ciprofloxacin, it actually increases the rate of plasmid transfer which makes these organisms then resistant to additional antimicrobials. So this is really like the worst case scenario, meaning that actually we don't diagnose these things, we give these drugs of which there are guidelines for and actually we make the condition worse. So what next and why am I here? So I've spent enough time probably talking about this. Uh, now we need to think about how we then challenge this. And there's lots of exciting scientific opportunities here. Uh, we're aiming to develop a, a global health strategy as Caroline uh, alluded to to generate new data and also hopefully with a view of them be being able to test and develop new interventions. And we're looking at all different alternatives really. So designing new poly uh, polyvalent uh, conjugate vaccines, studying how AMR works, but also then trying to identify new small molecules and take those forward to the point where we can actually test them. Uh, I'm very interested in trying to develop monoclonal antibody therapies and also then potentially interacting with social scientists and other people to try and uh, look at technologies to reduce antimicrobial usage in the population. And that is my uh, little bit for today. And if you have any questions, and I'm happy to answer them before we move on to the next speaker. Thank, thank you very much, Steve. Um, that's fantastic talk. Um, just quickly, if you could answer this question from, from Nabil. Um, how important is the use of antibiotics in animal husbandry, not only in developing countries, but also developed economies? How important is it? Well, it's important on the basis of the fact that it's used as a growth promoter uh, and also for prevention of infection. Um, so that's considered to be relatively important for maintaining food output. With respect to the interaction between how it causes resistance in human populations, um, actually the, there's, a, there's a big trope on this is very, very, very common. An animal uses the most likely mechanism for introducing drug resistance into humans. Actually, this is not particularly well proven, particularly in Asia. Even though antimicrobial usage essentially associates with resistance, if you look at organisms that cross over between animals and humans, often there is a limited uh, interaction between those different AMR genes. So it's probably a player, but probably not as big a player as we'd like to think. Thanks, Steve. Um, there's a reminder in the, in the Zoom chat that you can put to your questions that we don't have time to answer on the Slack channel. So please do that and we'll try and make sure those questions are, are addressed. Um, our next speaker is James Smith. He's a GP and public health consultant. Um, his primary role is for the Department of Public Health and Primary Care, teaching the clinical medical students on global health and environmental change. Um, he's also co-lead for sustainability for the sustainability theme in the Cambridge Public Health IRC. So it's good to have that another theme represented here. Um, he's previously worked for the NHS Sustainable Development Unit and Public Health England on climate change and sustainability. So welcome, James. I invite you to share your screen and give your talk. Thank you. Um, uh, just to say, could one of the hosts turn on my video because it was turned off earlier and I'm not allowed to turn it on, it appears. I'll just share my screen. Right, can you see that, Caroline? I can, thank you, James. Great. So um, as Caroline said, so I work as a GP and a public health consultant and most of my role in the university is on teaching, but I'm also um, working to de develop the sustainability theme within the um, Cambridge Public Health uh, Interdisciplinary Research Centre. And um, I'm not going to talk about specific research today. I just wanted to um, explore the idea of planetary health and how uh, transformational I thought it would be in the coming years and really to provoke discussion uh, amongst all of you about uh, what this means for you and to think about um, how we could uh, take this forward. So my sort of provocation to you, my, my challenge to you is that we should all be working on um, planetary health issues 
um, now, not five years, not 10 years. Um, and I'm not suggesting we stop everything else. We, we obviously need to be working on the corporate determinants of health and antimicrobial resistance and all the other um, important uh, global health work we do, the clinical work. Um, but this, this, this potentially um, uh, could transform all of that. And I think uh, it's important that we're all past that. So I'm gonna try and justify that in the next few slides. So planetary health as a concept is perhaps um, uh, not a new one, but it, it's perhaps a new phrase to you. Um, it really is about um, recognizing that human health and the civilizations upon which our modern health depends, um, in turn depends on natural systems. And so it encompasses all the um, environmental issues like climate change and biodiversity, um, air pollution, water pollution, those sorts of things that um, people would have recognized perhaps under a previous or another, another banner in terms of uh, environmental sustainability and sustainable development. So it, it's, a, it's another way of expressing that. Um, I'm gonna use climate change as the example um, because it's the one that I work on the most um, to explore this and uh, justify my proposition to you. But climate change um, uh, was uh, particularly came to uh, fore in the, the medical literature when the Lancet and UCL ran a couple of uh, commissions on it over the last, um, just over a decade now. So in 2009, they ran with this front page on the left, suggesting that it's potentially the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. And the reason they're suggesting that is it's not just the direct impacts which we're already seeing with one degree of warming um, now of uh, extreme weather, of things like um, uh, extreme uh, cyclones and hurricanes or the, the wildfires um, that are, are burning in parts of the world. Um, it's also all the indirect effects and particularly um, on things like um, food supplies and water supplies and then what that does to social stability and risk of conflict. Um, so there's a huge, um, a huge range of impacts from environmental change. What was interesting about the, the work of the Lancet Commission was when it came to um, 2015, time to do the second commission, they'd flip this round and recognizing that the transformational change um, needed to address climate change was a huge, huge opportunity for health. So when Sarah talks about the food system um, being a huge problem and a driver of non-communicable disease, my brain is going, well, that's great because we need to change that anyway for climate change. We need to address our diets. We need to address um, uh, how we move around, how we build our homes, how we heat our homes, all sorts of things like that, that have health benefits, but also um, are central to addressing climate change. So this is, this is the, the um, framing that we're starting to see about climate change and health. Um, but what I really wanted to get across to everyone was that um, these environmental problems, particularly climate change, but also biodiversity loss and other things like that, they're, um, they're, they're highly time sensitive. So I, I think more and more people are realizing that, but I don't think we've sort of um, translated that into our response to it. So um, this diagram on the left is showing that um, is trying to communicate that there are these uh, environmental tipping points. The, the uh, earth systems, like the climate system, doesn't change in a linear way. Um, so it, it will, there'll be feedback loops that will lead to tipping points. And early on in the global reports, you can see on the left of the graph there in 2001, um, they thought these tipping points wouldn't come until we got to a, a quite severe global warming in three, four, five, six degrees. And as the science about tipping points has developed more and more and our understanding has, we've, under, we've understood that those, those tipping points could come earlier and earlier. And we're now very close to passing through them. Um, and these tipping points and the environmental impacts that we're already seeing with one degree of warming um, are then pr prompting a social response. So I think it's not just the environmental response that's non-linear, but it's also the social response. So the, the picture on the right is of one of the climate marches in Cambridge outside Kings. And so I guess um, what I'm trying to say is that the pace of change, I'm seeing everything accelerating towards us. And that then challenges us to think, how do we respond to that? And so the policy response, um, you can argue about whether it's quick enough, um, but we're, we're seeing that move towards us. So the Paris Agreement you'll be familiar with has started to set some global um, ambitions. In the UK, we had um, the first global, uh, first National Climate Change Act uh, in 2008, which set an 80% um, decarbonisation target by 2050. But last year that was updated to be a, a net zero target by 2050. So we're seeing that move towards us. And I wouldn't be surprised if these targets move closer and closer. 
The NHS in England, um, so the National Health Service in England, just last month set a target of net zero by 2040 for direct emissions. And that's, so that's 10 years ahead of the national target. And within the university, um, we have got we have targets set for that. And we're, we're, we're developing these cross university themes, Cambridge Zero being the, the one focused on climate change, but also the sustainability theme within Cambridge Public Health. So I wanted to finish by just um, thinking about what this means for all of us. So I, I'm, I'm imagining that some people watching this are researchers, some are clinicians, um, some work in policy perhaps, I think wherever you work, this is relevant. This, this, this transformational change that needs to happen. So if we're thinking about um, what net zero means, it means changing everything. It means changing our buildings, our diets, how we move around um, and, and probably what we do for our own work. And so I would say this is personal to everyone. Most people on this call will also be high emitters, which then in turn comes with um, a personal recognition that we're more responsible for this than most people in the world and that we are probably not going to be the ones most affected by it. So there's a huge justice issue to this as well. So it's deeply uncomfortable to have someone uh, talk to you about these issues and say, well, this is really bad. This is, um, you're in part responsible. It's gonna change your life. I mean, I feel uncomfortable thinking about my own life and I think about this all the time. So I think it's, um, it's also important to think about what we can do to address it. Um, we can, uh, I think we need to talk about it. I'm not here to say this is how it will work with all different, um, everyone's different roles. I think uh, it's about creating a dialogue about what that means. Um, so for example, I work as a GP and I work um, uh, in stuff to do with healthcare. So a lot of my work to do with climate change is to do with how could we create zero carbon general practice or um, I do some work about inhalers and those sort of things. So that's one way, that, that's an example of how it might relate to someone if you work in healthcare. What does your specialty look like? Uh, what does a net zero uh, pediatrics or cardiology or surgery look like? Um, if you work more on disease prevention, there's a huge scope as we've talked about for um, uh, changing diets and uh, ways of moving around. And then there's health protection where, where there's... Um, all the change that we've seen because of COVID it very much um, could provide a, an example of how transformation, both good and bad, can happen and, and how we might want to make transformation happen in the future. So it's, it's very uncomfortable, um, but because of the uncertainty and the scale of it, but it's also full of huge opportunities. And I think if we can um, have more conversation about it and um, move from that to action and committing resources to it, we could make a lot of progress. Um, so that's where I want to um, stop and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks very much, James, for that really important call to action. Um, Carol Brains is noting the launch of the university's green recovery report today, coordinated by Cambridge Zero um, as a sort of manifesto for government. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, James. Yeah, I mean, both Carol and myself were involved in one particular chapter of that report. Um, thinking about how it could help address inequalities and I think that's that's what I take from a lot of this is that um, I'm, I'm sitting here talking about climate change and planetary health but actually whichever your entry point into this if it's about um, trying to improve public health or, uh, and um, transforming society to do so I think they're all linked up so I think um, I think that report's a good example of that. And I just wondered, you mentioned, you mentioned COVID, but, but is there an opportunity here as well to see this as a, as a disruptor? I mean, my air travel has, has gone from pretty high to, to zero this year. I mean, how can, this, how can we use this as, again as an opportunity um, for change? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think there's, there's two things there. There's one is the changes that have happened driven by COVID, like to do with transport and um, uh, virtual uh, virtual communication and, and that's also very apparent in my day job as a GP you know all the telemedicine that we're doing now um, but also just as an example of how change can happen and actually thinking well society can change really quickly and I think I think my um, I used to think that that all this change to do with climate change would be uh, you know we do a percentage reduction a year over the next 40 years and that's and I, I don't think that's what will happen now I think it's accelerating towards us and it will happen in these steps and these non-linear jumps and so the challenge for us as individuals and as um, groups of individuals whether it's a research group or a group of clinicians is how do we respond to that personally like how do we have that sort of 
uh, resilience and support systems to to ensure that we thrive in that more for me personally I find it a more challenging challenging um challenging sort of social situation like having change come at you more rapidly is quite challenging thank you very much um we'll move on to our next speaker now but thank you James and I think everyone keep that keep James's presentation in mind um and his call to action uh, really important so now I invite uh, Florence Nabriri to give her talk. Florence is an investigator scientist um, at MRC Nutrition and Bone Health Research um, and visiting worker at the MRC Epidemiology Unit. Um, her current research in investigates the influence of diet, nutrition and HIV status during pregnancy and lactation on bone health in African women and their children. So welcome Florence. I invite you to, to share your screen and give your presentation. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> Caroline. Yeah, I'm going to talk this morning about the effect of antiretroviral therapy for Ugandan women living with HIV. Uh, just need to make this full screen. Uh, a bit of background is that um, globally about 38 million people are living with HIV and about half are women. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for the Can you see my slides? Okay. They're, still, they're not on present of you yet, Florence. We can st we can see the slides, but um, if you click the, on the presenter icon, I think it'd be clearer. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. I don't know what's happening. Can you see them now? We can see we can see the sort of the, the background slides front. So I think you're welcome to carry on as you are, or, or I can ask um, the owner to share the slide on your behalf. Can you see it now? That's perfect. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. So I was just saying that Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for the greatest proportion of women living with HIV. That's over 70 percent and also over 90 percent of pregnant women living with HIV. And the greatest burden of HIV infection is in Eastern, Eastern Southern Africa. If you, you can see on this map, the very red parts of the continent. And so because uh, HIV can be transmitted from the mother to the baby, the World Health Organization recommends that all pregnant women are initiated on ART and that's to prevent, uh, to protect the babies. And in, by 2019, 87% of pregnant women who are on ART lived in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And because this is a, a resource limited setting where most women cannot uh, afford to provide alternative infant feeding options. So WHO recommends that women who, are, who have infants should breastfeed while receiving ART. That's to, for child survival. And so in 2019, over 1 million children were born to women with HIV and so they were exposed to ART. So the, there's a many studies which have been done in mostly in men and Caucasian stud, in Caucasian countries and they have shown that when people initiate ART there's a decrease in bone mineral density and this is about two to six percent and people don't actually recover back but BMD stabilizes after two years of ART. So most of these studies excluded pregnant and pre lactating women. And that's because uh, insertion of breastfeeding is also associated with reduction in bone mineral density. So we can see in this graph here that when women are breastfeeding, they mobilize calcium from bone. So BMD goes down, but where it recovers from six months of lactation. And when they stop breastfeeding, most data shows that uh, 
women fully recover bone mineral. So it doesn't have a lasting negative impacts on BMD. However, data is limited on changes in bone mineral density in breastfeeding women who are also starting ART because these two curves seem to go down at the same time in, that, in these women. And also there's data that ART can pass to, to the baby via the placenta and breast milk. And there's also very limited data on infant bone mineral accretion for those born to women on, on ART. So as part of my PhD, uh, I started my PhD in 2013, completed 2018. So this was the main study I did for my PhD. And we have set up a study to look at the changes in bone mineral density in women who are starting ART when they are pregnant and they go on to breastfeed. So this study was set up in Uganda at Mulago Hospital and the antenatal clinic at the time, now it has moved to another hospital, but this clinic at the time saw over 100 women you know, registering new pregnancies per day. And generally in Uganda, there's a high prevalence of HIV and the current recommendation at the time was that all HIV positive pregnant women are offered ART. And that's for their own health and also to prevent mother to child transmission of HIV. So this was a longitudinal study. We measured bone mineral density, body composition and bone mineral metab metabolites uh, in pregnant and lactating women and their infants. So we recruited two groups of women. We had 95 HIV positive women who are starting ART for the first time when they are pregnant. And we recruited 96 negative women as controls who are age matched for reference. Uh, we also, the measurements were done, bone mineral density measurements were done postpartum. That's because you cannot do BMD DEXA measurements in pregnancy. So we measured them at two weeks, 14 weeks and 26 weeks of lactation. And to look at recovery of bone mineral density after breastfeeding, the women were measured three months post lactation, that's NPNL. We also measured their babies at this time point up here, but additional time points at 12 and 18 months of age. So the study was undertaken under collaboration. This was led by the MRC Nutrition and Bone Health Research Group led by Professor Anne Prentice. The group was previously based at the MRC LC Widowson Laboratory, which closed in 2018, and now we are hosted at the MRC EPID. So Professor Anne Prentice group had a lot has a lot of experience conducting bone health studies in Africa and especially pregnancy and lactation studies. And so this we collaborated with partners in Uganda. Well, the other the first partner in Uganda was Muju. This is the Makere University, John Hopkins University Limited. And this was an this an impo important collaborator in this study because they have the dual energy X-ray machine machines, that's DEXA, and this enables us to measure BMD. So studies of looking at BMD are limited in Africa because these machines are uh, available in less than five countries in Africa. So we are lucky that there is one in Uganda. Then we also collaborated with Baylor Uganda. They are main, mainly focused on pediatric HIV. And I used to work in this organization before and they were very willing to support my study. And so they were the main host. And together we were able to set up the study and coordinate everything through the collaboration. So the main findings from this study, we saw that women, this graph here, the red line is HIV positive women on ART, and the green line is uh, HIV negative women, our reference. So we can see that the women lost more bone mineral during lactation, and the HIV positive women lost more BMD during lactation, and they were not able to recover after they stopped. We also see that their children, many of them were stunted by one year compared to children born to HIV negative women. 
Uh, so the importance of this is that uh, fracture risk is uh, predicted to increase worldwide and the greatest increase will be in Africa and Asia. And there's a, so HIV and ART are recognized as uh, risk factors for fractures. And this study has provided evidence that women who are breastfeeding and they are on ART may have experience greater bone loss and this calls for interventions to maintain bone health and optimal diet and nutrition. Just to wrap up, there's also another collaboration we have between me and Dr. Rose Parks. Uh, we are looking at the impact of COVID-19 on food security in Uganda and this is because people who are HIV positive on ART and they, when they are food insecure, they are not able to take their drugs. So whatever interventions we want to do and look at bone health, that we can still do that. But if they are not on ART for treatment, then that's not going to be very useful. So Dr. Rose is running us studies in Uganda using an automated voice calls where you can be able to collect data. And so we have been funded by GCRF to be able to develop a, a food security module in this and therefore we'll be able to deploy the tool to assess food security among HIV and other populations. Thank you um, for your time. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for sharing the, uh, um, your PhD research and, and the information about this new study. Um, I'm just going to ask a, a quick question. Could you probably expand a little bit on the sorts of interventions that you might be able to implement to improve bone health um, in lactating women? So the, we'll be able to, I think we will be one thing is to look at whether supplementation will be useful. So if you gave calcium and vitamin D supplements, whether that will be helpful in this group. Although the supplements in um, women who are not HIV positive in the Gambia did not improve bone health. But since these are patient populations, we'll be interested to look at that. And, and also promoting optimal diets because we know that nutrition transition and poor diets also impact on bone health. So that's an area which needs to be ad addressed. Thank you very much, Florence. So, so lots of rich areas for future, future research. Um, I'm gonna wrap up now, thanking all the speakers for their fantastic presentations. Um, it's been a really interesting session. Um, I'm gonna remind you that during the break, um, there's a a tutorial on mural um, and please do add your activities and your ideas on the uh, barriers and facilitators for um, uh, equitable collaborations to, to the mural um, and we're going to take a break for 10 minutes now um, since we've finished at 11.02 we'll come back at 11.12 um, so thank you very much to all our speakers Give them a round of applause uh, and see you back here in 10 minutes thanks everyone Hi everybody, so we're just going to show you the um, portal page. So this is the portal and if you log in you can scroll down and see all the different information on there and this video which we're just going to play on the mural and how to contribute to it. Hi, I'm Sophie and I work for Cambridge Global Health Partnerships and this is Susie and we're just gonna be giving you an introduction to Mural. So Mural functions as almost like a wall at a conference room, and it's a fabulous tool for collaboration. So how do we do this? So during the conference, we're going to be talking about things through Zoom, but in Mural, we need to use a browser. So one of these could be Firefox, Chrome, or Microsoft Edge. And you need to make sure that you have a recent and updated version of one of these browsers in order to use Mural. So once you're in Mural, there are three quick tips which will make um, your ability to use Mural a lot quicker and you can move around and contribute easily and effectively. So number one, moving around in Mural. So just below us, um, you can see that there's an outline and you can use outline mode to move around. So we're in outline mode right now. 
Alternatively, to scroll in and out, you can use your mouse. So just use the scroller to go in and out, as Susie's demonstrating. You can use your keyboard. So you could use control and plus or minus. Or you can use the navigation map in the bottom right hand corner of Mural. Or alternatively, hit the space bar and then just click and drag your way around Mural. So number two, editing or adding a post-it note. This is really, really easy. So you just need to double click to add a post-it note and then type away. You can also modify the post-it note. So there's lots of different options on the toolbar above. You can change the color or increase or decrease the size of text. And then you can also copy and paste your stick it. So you can just do that in the same way that you would do normally in other applications. So we're going to now move on to number three, which is the way in which we'll be asking you to contribute to the landscape mural during the, during the uh, conference. So during the conference and between the 9th and the 19th, we'll be asking you to contribute to this East of England Global Health Landscape. And on the 9th, Susie will be giving you a little bit of information and some tips and the link for accessing Mural and how to do this. So more instructions to follow. So finally, what's the overall benefit? So the overall benefit of using Mural just allows us to see the whole. It's about shared benefit. It allows us to collaborate better. And ultimately, it'll enable us to collaborate for impact. So we hope you've enjoyed this little intro to Mural and we look forward to seeing you on the 9th and the 19th. Thank you.
Um, so welcome back um, from the break, uh, everyone. Um, Fiona, uh, would it be possible for, yeah, for us to share our videos? So I'm requesting um, the panelists for this next session um, to uh, share uh, their videos. And while we're just waiting for that, maybe the panelists that are on um, can introduce themselves. Um, my name is Rosalind uh, Ratanchi and um, I am in um, uh, Institute of Public Health, um, now um, moved to PHPC, and um, I'm a Principal Research Associate um, with research mainly in Uganda. Um, I'm also the co-lead of um, one of the um, co-leads of the new Global Health uh, Pillar for the IRC. Um, so while we're just waiting, I can see Evelyn um, uh, on her video. So maybe Evelyn, you could introduce yourself um, and also then we'll move to um, Aliko. Thank you, Roz. So I'm the director for Cambridge Global Health Partnerships. So we're based on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus and working across kind of all arms of the university, but also the NHS institutions um, and others in Cambridge working on global health. So really pleased to be part of this panel discussion this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor um, Aliko, could you introduce yourself? Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And thanks for such an expert and, and enlightening session so far. My name is Aliko Ahmed. I'm the Regional Director of Public Health for East of England for both the NHS and Public Health England, and I'm a fellow of Wilson College Global Health mainly, and Hughes Hall as well. Um, my interest mainly is around transitional and translational research and how you make the policy impact from evidence-based research. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, next up, we have Renata Schaefer. Renata, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, hi, thank you. Thank you, Rose. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Renata Schaefer. I work in the Strategic Partnership Office in the, in, in the university and I look after, I'm responsible for um, public international partnerships. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, next, we have Stephen uh, Baker, um, who you've already heard, but um, just in case people have just joined, maybe Steve, you could just introduce yourself again. Yep, so um, I'm Stephen Baker. Um, I'm a uh, molecular microbiologist um, working at the uh, Cambridge Institute of Therapeutic Immunology and Infectious Diseases, and my interests are in um, drug-resistant uh, bacteria. And last, but definitely by no means least, we have Professor Carol Brain. Um, Carol, perhaps you could introduce yourself. Hello, um, everybody. Um, really terrific to see everyone and great to hear all the speakers. And I have the privilege of helping to co-lead Cambridge Public Health, the new uh, interdisciplinary centre that um, uh, Caroline described earlier on. And um, thanks for uh, asking me to join the panel. Thank you so much. So, um, I mean, we've had some introductions about the IRC um, this this morning. Um, given us an introduction to their their global health research. It's been uh, fascinating uh, so far. Um, so, Carol Lyon introduced um, the IRC um, with the global health pillar, and really the purpose of this session is to um, get some um, input from our panelists on um, the, uh, their thoughts on shaping um, global health uh, within the university and within the wider region, but also um, to really seek some engagement from yourselves um, on this topic. Um, and so to begin with, we actually are going to um, do a little bit of an interactive session where we're going to ask you to complete a poll. So in a second, a question should come up on the screen and you'll be able to click on your preferred answer. 
And I think you have 15 seconds um, to, to, to complete the answer. So I think um, Fiona is um, bringing up the question, is that right? So the first question is, do you feel that Cambridge um, has strengths in global health currently? So do we currently have strength in global health? And I think you have um, 15 seconds to submit what you feel um, about this. Thank you. So um, we've got a moderate level of agreement, um, about 10% of people disagree, um, nobody strongly disagreeing, but only about 30% think we have a, a, a very, a, you know, feel very strongly that we have a strength in global health. So that's an interesting um, interesting uh, span of, of activities. And it really, um, I think, speaks to what Caroline had, had mentioned before about, um, you know, we're, we're not great at uh, communicating what we're up to and, and, and what's going on. And that's something that the pillar will try to, to address. So we, we have another question now um, before you all relax. Um, so perhaps we could have the next question on the screen. So the next question is, do you feel that we have potential to do more? So given that, you know, we, we have some, some capacity from, from your um, last answers, do you think that we should be growing and we have the potential to do more in this space? So again, I think you probably have about 10 seconds left to answer. Thank you. Great, so, okay, well, that's very strongly encouraging. Uh, we're very happy to see that result. That means that we have some more work to do, um, but it means that, you know, from, the, from this audience, at least we have, um, you know, agreement that there is more that we can do um, and, and, and potential to do more in this area. So with that, thank you so much for that. There'll be a couple more polls um, later in the session, but for now, we'll go on to our, our, our panel questions. So the first question is that, you know, we, we've already talked about um, and heard about people's uh, research and, and people's ideas, um, but we also have, have heard mention of, of some challenges and, and some silos across the, the university, given that we're a large and complex university with lots of different initiatives. So the first question is, how can we engage across the whole university to make sure that we can build uh, better collaborations. And I think maybe for this question, we'll go first to Carol. Um, and um, we'll, we'll hear from Carol first, who really has been the brain behind um, the, the public health um, at Cambridge and, and public health IRC. So thanks. Um, so I suppose the history is that um, we have, it, within um, elements of oh, different constituencies within the university across the different schools, there's been a lot of uh, engagement internationally and with um, uh, the global uh, or global entities, maybe not global health um, as it's uh, sometimes sort of more narrowly framed. But um, this has grown over time and then this and it grow, has, has grown in a kind of um, investigator led uh, manner. And then we've had the interdisciplinary research centres, interdisciplinary working um, attempted across the university. And that's been very successful um, when it's focused in um, particular areas such as global food security. Uh, but of course, all of these different things have a, have a health component. Uh, and almost pretty well all, all that we do has a health and well-being for individuals and society. Um, aim because that's effectively a, what we want to do as human species um, but uh, the challenge in terms of making it work collectively is clearly visibility com communication a willingness to engage and actually and trying trying to establish what is the I suppose you could call it the sweet spot but what is the th what are the things that really make it work for all parties so that there is uh, a, a, there's true res true respect and true kind of equality in the ways that we work, whether it's across the region or whether it's it's um, um, across the world, and so that we are building strong, sustainable partnerships that can sustain the kinds of work that indeed James talked about and Car and, and Caroline in particular and 
with uh, Steve's a fantastic illustration of, of the power of that kind of work. So I think the we, we have kind of the tool, we have some of the tools, but I'd be really, really pleased to hear the other panelists' views and also any views from other parts of the region um, and those who are attending who aren't from Cambridge, who can see, well, why isn't Cambridge doing it this way? So very open to hearing, you know, any kind of um, recommendations or advice. Thank you, Carol. And perhaps may we can maybe go to Evelyn next um, as her role of um, head of Cambridge um, University Global Health Partnerships. Thanks, Evelyn. Thanks, Roz. Um, I'm not sure you, I'm sure you didn't mean to, but in a sense, you said Cambridge University. <laughs> and of course, I think where I speak from, we're not formally part of the university, which I think is a good thing, but also a challenging thing. And that is, I mean, I've worked now in this um, for 12 or so years, kind of on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. And I don't understand well yet, kind of how the university works and how best to engage in these discussions. Now, I, I know that all sorts of people from all parts of the, the region, the university will also feel similar. There's no perfect way. Of course there isn't, it is about, it is about networking, et cetera. But I do think that that is a challenge. And if we can just find a way to provide more clarity and a clearer way of communicating such that we more easily bring people together and no matter where they sit, I think we need to be you know, careful about some of those hierarchies that sometimes I think might frighten people. As a non-academic as well, I sort of sometimes feel slightly anxious thinking, crikey, can I join these discussions? Well, of course I can. And we should really make every effort to make it as open as possible within Cambridge. And only by doing that can we then, I think, speak to working better with then our partners from outside of the region and outside of Cambridge. Okay, th thank, thank you, Evelyn. Maybe, maybe we can go to Stephen now. Stephen, as being reasonably new to the university and having had perspectives from outside and trying to navigate your way ar ar around um, learning about Cambridge, um, I wonder if you have any um, perspective on, on, on this and your thoughts. Yeah, I think I've learned a lot in the, the last 18 months. Um, but if Evelyn says she's still kind of struggling to understand the overall scenery at 12, 12 years on, then I've got a long way to go. I, I think that there is a, a huge potential here for, for better integrated research in this area. Um, and it's trying to work out the best mechanism to do that. Uh, we have some fantastic work going on in various corners of the world and really groundbreaking um, initiatives going on within Cambridge. We just need to work out a scheme that works better to push those things together to make it look like we're having a concerted effort to make something, as was pointed out earlier, everyone uses the word sustainable, that appears to be more sustainable in this area rather than just going from independent research project to independent research project. Now I do understand there, there is a balance here because um, research projects, research does work like this, that we're all dependent on grant funding project by project uh, but actually by potentially coming up with something that's a little more streamlined and integrated together, it may actually facilitate better interaction uh, for the way of getting more projects and more funding to make sure that, that we can actually do this. So I think that by combining forces, having more of an initiative, being more strategic, we probably get, can get access to more funding to make this more sustainable. Thank you. So I think we'll go to, to, to Prof. Alico, who has, um, uh, will have an interesting perspective because his role within the colleges. Um, and then we'll let Renata as, as Central University have the last word on, on, on this topic. Um, Prof. Alico. Thank you very much. And I voted for the strongest agreement there for the two questions. Maybe that's just a bit of my optimistic mind. <laughs> um, I've been re related with Cambridge now for almost 20 years, not necessarily as an employee of the university, but as a very close partner. And I think there are a lot of assets on it because I rather look at what is strong rather than what is wrong in, the, in, in this discussion. And I think when you look at it to me 20 years ago when I relate to Cambridge, you can see the international reputation and attracting people from all over the world still is there. 
I remember one of the MPhil programs on epidemiology, there were about 16 nationalities from all over the world coming around to do that. So the international reputation of Cambridge is an asset. And also when you look at the different excellent lecturers and professors and academics that we have, people with very, very fantastic pieces of research with international impact on them. I'm talking about people, so many of them, you know, people like Gordon Dugan, James Wood, Nick Ware, and Carol Brain. There are so many people. So there are excellent researchers across with very, very big portfolios that have global health impact. And then when you look at also, there are individuals that have transcend the academic to policy space who are within this space, which is an asset for the school. So I'm talking about people like Dame Sally Davis. Now we have Carol Black. There are many like that. There are other additions as well. We have increasing platforms now where you are seeing colleges like Wolfson and Hughes Hall are bringing sort of platform to create interdisciplinary way of working across contemporary global health challenges. That I think is an asset. You have the Cambridge Global Health Partnership, which provide another platform for those who want to do global health delivery. So we have all the jigsaws and the assets there. I think perhaps one opportunity to explore is what Stephen is saying, is that horizontal linkages. How can people come together and work through an interdisciplinary lens where we take a particular global health challenge and perhaps bring our discipline into that. It's a public health approach, essentially, where you every aspect of strength is, maxim, is maximized. How do we optimize the individual skills and expertise and bring them together towards a common solution that is contemporarily seen or acknowledged within the global health community? So I personally feel there is a strong asset there, is how we optimize that asset. That's why I'm really involved in my time with Wilson and with Hughes to try and create this platform. And it is a the horizontal linkages. I think that will give us maybe the maximum impact on this. Thank, thank you, Aliko. So I'm hearing similar similar themes uh, uh, across. So, so Renata, I'm um, wondering what the, the the kind of central university perspective is on 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 this, and in terms of encouraging us to to collaborate and make use of of the assets um, that that Aliko is mentioning. Oh, great. Thanks, Ross. So um, it's quite nice to become last because I think, you know, I've heard and, you know, I kind of, I, I agree with everything and I think the university agrees with everything that's been said. I mean, Cambridge is a very bottom up place. So in itself is a challenge and is always going to be a challenge. Um, we've been doing international and collaborations across the globe for a very long time. But it's, it's been, it was recognized a while ago and it's known that it's always been very organically, right? So it just happens, it kind of happens. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, there was a call, you know, we need to be a little bit more strategically, but very aware that, you know, it's never going to be about Cambridge telling somebody what they do, where and how and with whom. Yeah, it's about, you know, what are the values, what are the principles that we need, that we should be working towards. So um, after uh, quite a large consultation that was done actually by my pre predecessor in this role, um, the, the university has its first uh, towards international strategy, which is a document which is, um, at the moment it's in our website, but I'm not gonna, you know, it's not very user-friendly at the moment. Uh, we envisage to make this more user-friendly in the, in soon. But what it does, it tries to set very, in very broad terms, what are the values and principles that the university should be working under? Uh, which is something that hopefully, you know, will underpin a lot of the stuff that's been said now. Um, it is, and, and also the enablers, what can we as a university do to enable and facilitate this to happen? So I'm not going to go through all of this, but just some, some key points, which I think links, uh, is going to link to the discussions that we're going to have, you know, for the following questions. You know, it talks about the freedom of thought and expression, which is something that underpins the university, and that's always going to be the case. It's especially relevant now with a lot of um, issues in geopolitical issues in certain regions that we are working with. Equality and diversity, clarity and transparency. And then we go into respectful and equitable 
engagement. Now, that's really, really critical to everything that we are talking here. Um, you know, it's co-creating with a partner in country whenever that's possible. And that, that sits very, very much um, in, in, as a pillar of what, of, of what and how we should be doing things. Ethical working, and last but not least, the environmental awareness. As you know, Cambridge Zero uh, published their report this morning. Uh, it commits to an absolute zero carbon reduction by 2048. And we need to ensure that what we do individually is consistent with that goal. So I think that's something that we're gonna be working on and more policies and guidance is, is, is gonna be coming out of the university centrally to all the PIs in the near future. So yeah, so this is centrally what we are doing. Thank you so much. That sounds very, um, uh, you know, uh, useful and, and exciting as a, as, a, as a document. We very much look forward to that. And it actually brings us nicely to our next uh, poll question, which is um, uh, about equity. So, so you mentioned equitable partnerships. Um, for those um, who are interested in equitable partnerships, and, and there is um, a bit more on the mural, if you see the mural. Um, but if you could also, um, if we could have the next poll question so that we can put it out to our, our participants. Um, while we're just finding the poll question, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. So the next poll question that should be coming on your screen in a second is, do you see the partnerships that Cambridge has currently in global health to be uh, equitable? Um, so um, I'm hoping um, that, um, is it Fiona that's doing the poll, Evelyn? I think we just need to nudge um, yes. our poll person. Is it Fiona? Could we have the next poll question? That's great, thank you so much. So do you see the partnerships that Cambridge has in global health to be equitable? So in, in talking to the to um, Renata's um, central uh, policy, this obviously is um, a priority for us going forward and, and, and we'll have some panel discussion around, around Not equitable, somewhat equitable. Maybe that's actually a faux pas that um, that that, that um, uh, we can work with. But there's a somewhat equitable response, and I think that that brings us to to, to asking the panel about this. Um, so, so in a way. The question is how do we develop genuinely equity? Um, but uh, Aliko, I wonder, um, I wonder if you could maybe take um, uh, this uh, uh, question. Um, and um, equitable is a is a public health um, term, and. Um, um, and I wonder if um, you would maybe let us know what your understanding of, of, public, uh, of equitable is. Thank you very much again. And maybe perhaps just to start so that, because I think global health means a lot different things for different people. But I think as a construct, we all agree that the principles of it is about equity, it's about reciprocity, it's about collaborative partnership. So I think in terms of what we have seen in Cambridge, one can say that there is always room for improvement. I think we have seen a bit of asymmetry in terms of how we, the curriculum, the engagement and privileges as well. I think it is very difficult to just see it as Cambridge phenomenon alone. But I think as a whole global health field, we all know that there has been characterization of asymmetries both in terms of language, in terms of knowledge exchanges, in terms of um, curricular development, in terms of education and training, in terms of funding. I think there is a huge amount that can be done to address that. The imbalances are very, very acute and anybody can see that. And I think some of it is also linking back to this emerging field or understanding of what we call decolonization, 
with all these different definitions, essentially on how do we really see global health as not necessarily an endeavor where a high income institution or a higher income country is helping the poor country because that tends to be the kind of narrative always when you talk about global health because even in some of the discusses about high income or low income while actually the underpinning principles of global health is about interdependency geographical alignment partnership contributions reciprocity by directionality all of those things. I haven't had a single any discussion so far that's to just work being done by colleagues in England and perhaps in America as seen as global health. It's only when you see work done between maybe England and Nigeria or Uganda that we tend to do that. So it may be unintentional, but there is inequitable thought processes as well as just not the actions that we do. And I think as the vice chancellor of the university said recently, the thoughts of people thinking that they are not thinking about those imbalances in itself can be the problem of the imbalances. So I think there is a lot more to do about the equity. When you look at education and training as well, we do have people who we invite to do to Cambridge Africa, many of the scholarships to come and study here. But Apart from that, how many of our global health partners coming from low-income countries, when you look at the ratio of those who go to those areas versus who come here, the exchange isn't symmetrical at all. So there are imbalances that we have to honestly think about it. Global health is about equity. It's about collaboration. It is slightly different from what used to be um, international health or what used to be colonial medicine which is essentially we are there to help you. We, are in an interglo we, are in a, we have a global interdependencies now, whereby we need to look at how we balance that, learn from each other, listen from each other. Human lives are sacred. They are the same anywhere you are. Access should be the same in terms of care, in terms of quality. So I think there is a lot for us to think about. If there is something that COVID has taught us is how to be humble and to appreciate human vulnerabilities is same everywhere. And I think we in Cambridge, we can learn as much from that as anywhere else. I, thank you so much, Aliko. And, and, and so I think that this is something that, that as co-chairs of the IRC that we've been uh, trying to think uh, about, um, and certainly also Sarah, Sarah Steele mentioned the new MPhil in global health, and um, we are having an active discussion about, you know, decolonizing within the, the, the teaching of, of the global health MPhil, and maybe we need to think about actually the word global health, like you say, and whether this is even the right terminology. But, uh, but I'd like to ask Steve, because Steve um, has been part of that discussion on, on, on the IRC pillar, and, and what thoughts you have um, about this, Steve, moving forward. Thank, thank you, Alika. Yeah, so I've, 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 this is something that's very close to my heart. I mean, having spent um, 12 years working in, in one of the Oxford units, um, I've, seen, I've seen both sides of this. Um, there's, there's a bit of a, there's, there's lots of different moving parts of the machine here that we can't ignore. Um, so often um, the, the way global health in its current definition of the one that we're probably more comfortable with than others will probably need to change it, is that it's very much dictated by um, funding organizations um, in Europe and the US. Um, and therefore then we as researchers in those locations are, are often in a better position to apply and to compete for those funding and then develop programs of research there. Now, in my particular previous position, I was, um, found it that one of my actually one of the best parts of my job was taking people from the local university and then developing them personally the problem with that was then I was also then dependent on the person bringing in money from Welcome or Gates or wherever to do the project so it it kind of worked but then um, there was no real long-term view so what can we do that's different in this space then I think that where we can have a difference is that actually then we use Cambridge as a bit of a hub for this kind of work. 
uh, and then we try and develop partnerships overseas and actually work in collaboration whereby we apply for projects jointly between our collaborative individuals or organizations and then we provide support for people to come here and work with us uh, and then for people from here to go and work overseas and then we have this backwards and forwards truly kind of equitable interaction not necessarily where we direct the research questions but actually we have more communication with people overseas about what the main research questions and priorities are for them rather than what we then perceive them to be are the, the issue with that then is raising money for it because as we know um, that these things priorities are often set in, in the west so therefore there needs to be then additional dialogue with funders welcome gates about what we're trying to do that's different and how we can try and create more of a sustainable infrastructure to train people and actually direct their own research rather than relying on people like us to do it with them. Uh, thank you, thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, that, it's it's good to get that perspective of being in in, in both um, settings, and I um, I echo some of that. Um, sorry, part of my problems with my sound is because I am currently in Uganda, so <laughs> apologies for, for 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 slight internet issues there. Um, so maybe I can turn to Evelyn um, uh, now because um, um, equitable partnerships are something um, that I know Evelyn is very passionate about. Thank you, Roz. Yes, I was really pleased um, to hear Renata, you talking about those um, principles that are included in the strategy, because I was going to raise those. So within the health partnerships movement, there um, that FET has developed across the 200 health partnerships plus that they've supported with UK aid funding, a series of eight principles that are not dissimilar to what you spoke about. And I think it's us really questioning ourselves as individuals but also as an organization as organizations in Cambridge that are working in this field whether we're actually really living by those principles and picking up on the stuff that Aliko said about humility you seldom hear people in Cambridge saying what what are we learning what am I going to learn from this it's too often about what is Cambridge going to contribute what am I going to teach and I think when you start out in that way you're already thinking unequally, aren't you thinking that you bring, perhaps are bringing more to the partnership than, than your partners. And I think we absolutely need to turn, turn that around. And I think that then comes also to a question of investment. And I, I do question where we're developing funding proposals and we're putting in for PhDs, master's degrees, the fees that we're charging for foreign students even though it's grant funded. And surely we should be looking at that and, and wondering how we're making it impossible within restricted funding for us to give equal opportunity to our overseas partners because they simply pay, have to pay so much more. So if we're serious about it, then I think we have to start thinking about those, those sorts of questions and really addressing them because um, they're not gonna go away and we kind of have to come up with a plan that's gonna make it more equitable from those starting points. Thank you, Evelyn. So um, the, the very um, interesting responses, and I think that there's a lot for myself and Caroline and, and, and Steve and the wider Global Health IRC um, pillar to really go away um, and, and digest. Um, as we're running short on time, um, I'd like to go to the last question, um, which is within the complexity that we've mentioned, and, and, and we brought up more questions in this panel discussion than we've answered, obviously, um, but, but within this complexity, how do we ensure that we can, um, that, 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 that the university, but also the East of England region can have an impact and, and play a role on the global stage over the next kind of five to 10 years. And I'd like um, to, to put that to Carol uh, first. So I think it's about partnerships. And um, so picking up Aliko's um, kind of call to action, it's about equitable partnerships with, um, with other part wherever they are. Um, and I, I think we need to be operating on the, or thinking about the impact, the impact component, as it were, and the partnerships that we need to build and develop, develop with business, with international partners, um, with um, the global actors, uh, the, the policy frameworks, as it were, UN, WHO, uh, within country, government, 
Um, and we do have, um, across the east of, east of England, we have a rich, a rich variety of, um, of um, ac actors, as it were, within the higher education institutions who can, if we, brought, if we, if we assemble our connections and our networks in a strategic way, I think we could have a much greater impact, um, even with, as it were, the partnerships that we already have. But I think there are areas in those that we need to strengthen a lot. Um, and one of those is actually comes back to Steve's, which, Steve's work, um, which shows how important it is to be in partnership with business, because we do need an economy in the systems that we have, in the way that we organise our societies at the moment. Business is, and the economy is very, very important, particularly and now coming out of COVID. And if we can assemble ourselves to be, to provide, um, to co-produce the work with all the different, with the different sectors, I think we can, um, we can really have an impact in the future. But I mean, that's a very kind of high level response, but I think those are the kinds of areas that we need to work in. As well as doing- Thank, thank you, Carol. And, and, and we're not a, perhaps the last word um, from you on this, um, you know, in terms of, of the, 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 the central university, how should we as a global, health uh, group, public health, um, uh, globally planetary health, um, uh, how, how should we work more with the Central University to really um, strategize around our... our um, thanks, Ross. I think I will answer in a slightly different way. I think listening to everyone, and it comes to no surprise, I think to, in order to underpin what you everyone is pr proposing, there has to be more central support. I mean, we, we need to be able to, to support whatever it is that you're doing. Um, things have improved a lot in the last few years, believe it or not, Steve. Uh, it's better than it used to be in terms of how we do due diligence, the safeguarding, gender equality. Um, and we are also trying to work closely with the funders. Somebody mentioned, you know, funders were mentioned and their agenda. And uh, more and more you see that their um, application process uh, equitable partnerships is actually embedded in those applications and we need to be able centrally to support that more and more um, and underpin the things that are that are important so for example um, you know our number one resource in the university are our people not only our academic staff but our students the people that come in and and also the our em employers the, the, the people that support whatever it is that you're doing um, and we need to get better at that. Um, and there is, you know, so we, we, we're calling those enablers, if you like, and it is part of our strategy to kind of work more in order to address those. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say, when you talk about global health and doing stuff in country, you know, the university has got experience in doing other activities in other areas in country, in China, in Singapore. There's another one coming up possibly soon, um, and we need to get better at sharing the information with everyone so that that is uh, a resource that you, you, you can use more widely and make the choices that are better. So I think in a nutshell, again, it's quite high level, but um, I hope that kind of addresses a bit of the, your question. Thank you, and and we're really looking forward to to, to like we mentioned the strategy and 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 working to hear more about um, uh, some of the initiatives. So just to to, to finish off now, um, we have um, one last question for the audience, which is an audience poll, and um, the question is really couched around the mission of the university. So the mission of the University of Cambridge is to contribute to society through the pursuit of ex education, learning and research at the highest levels of excellence. So with that in mind, with our, the, 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 the mission to contribute to society, our question to, to the, the group is, should we be striving to become a leader in global health? Um, do, do we agree that this is something that's an important priority um, uh, for us um, uh, moving forward? And we know that this sample is probably going to be positively biased because you've attended this conference, but it would be still after the discussion, it'd be still nice to hear your, your thoughts. So 
So um, thankfully, and, and thank you to everyone who contributed, we, we have a um, yes, strong agreement in, in striving to become a leader, which um, as with these things gives us more work to do, but it also um, you know, gives us um, confident that this is an important um, uh, initiative uh, within the, the public health IRC um, that we should be trying to, to, to move uh, forward with. So just in the last minute or so, I'd just like to thank all of our panelists for joining us. Um, at the end of these panel discussions, you always feel sad that you don't have more time um, to chat, but, but thank you to the panel for getting across your, your, your thoughts so um, succinctly. Um, I mean, some of the words that, that I've heard, we really need to think about taking forward. I think, you know, thinking about the, the decolonization within the education, the research, and, and some of the um, issues that have been discussed around that um, lead us to this, this, this word of symmetry and symmetrical, um, which I think is, is something that's very important. I think that, you know, Steve mentioned that there are groundbreaking initiatives within the university. And as Alika said, you know, this is a university that has a massively, um, a, a, a huge international reputation. Um, but, uh, but I also agree with Evelyn that it, 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 it feels difficult at the moment that there is such a a, a, a disparity in, in, in fees and, and how thinking about actually with the MPhil moving forward, how we can, you know, um, support um, a wider um, uh, global cohort to really be able to 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 benefit from um, uh, the education um, within the university. We're really looking forward, uh, Renata, and we thank you so much for introducing the strategy and 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 chatting a bit more about central support and as Aliko mentioned, assembling our assets together strategically to see how we can bring the groupings together. And the last thing I guess that we have to think about is outwardly communicating and outwardly communicating even within um, the university, within the um, East of England region, so we can we can reach out to our partners across the region. And, and we thank Evelyn and the team and, and Helen and the team for putting this conference together so that we can start those discussions. Um, and, um, you know, how we can um, reach out to, to, to produce these, these equitable partnerships. Um, finally, I'd just like to say um, that we would, there are, there is some, um, a, opportunity on the mural to use some post-it notes to um, talk a little bit more. We know that the poll questions were closed questions and we'd really like to get the richness of your thoughts and ideas as attendees on this conference and we're, we're so grateful for you joining us today. Um, there are a couple of questions. One is about the, the barriers um, to um, doing global health research within the university. And the other thing is the things that, that help you and the things that support you. It would be really great as we're moving forward with the, the IRC Global Health Pillar to get some feedback from the attendees today um, to really understand a little bit more about what the challenges and what the opportunities are. So please do go to the mural um, and interact with that. But thank you all. Um, so much um, and I see Renata's put the, the the link to the strategy which is great thank you so much um, and I hand over to uh, Tony um, for the, the closing remarks thank you good thank you very much Roz for that and thank you to the panelists too yeah so my job's just to reflect a little bit before we close um, at 12 we've kept time pretty well this morning so thank you very much to all the contributors for doing that. Um, so just to remember that we saw uh, Amanda Howe and her first presentation, which I hope embedded uh, primary care in our thinking, because this morning's session was all about public health and primary care and uh, Amanda with her vast international experience as well as uh, influential position, um, gave us a good start to the conference this morning. And then we turned to the sort of panelists and um, had a really good trip through a range of public health issues. Sarah talking about ultra processed food and other determinants, sugar and diet and so on. Steve talking about multiple drug resistance. James talking about the environment and planetary health big picture and what we can do as individuals. And Florence about um, a really good study in Uganda on HIV and bone density. 
So that gave you a kind of picture of the range of global public health that researchers, um, particularly in Cambridge and now uh, in Uganda and other parts of the world are undertaking. And then we uh, talked now with the panelists about the IRC and the collaboration uh, with public health, the current uh, struggles with equity between you know, Cambridge University being a well-endowed university and you know, the low middle-income countries versus ourselves. So big issues there to consider, but um, it made me reflect a bit about the Global Health Partnerships mission which we had a strategy development earlier in the year and it's uh, the mission is working in partnership to inspire and enable people to improve healthcare globally. And I think that matched very much the contributors from the University of Cambridge um, and also reinforces the benefit of public health networking that the Cambridge Institute of Public Health and Carol in particular have done over the years to try and network people. And remember that we were trying to reach out across the Eastern region, and it was good to have Aliko with us, who provides a East of England perspective from Public Health England. So excellent contributions, and thank you very much to that. So looking forward, um, please don't forget the second part of this conference, which is on November the 19th in the afternoon, starting at 1.30. And that afternoon session uh, begins to look at education, research and practice. And uh, we will obviously be taking the mural that we've started today to that conference to make sure that the two conferences are, are linked. So there will be three workshops, panels in that conference on research, education and practice. And there's a keynote speech from Dame Sally Davis uh, to uh, help finish it off. Uh, so that's November the 19th uh, afternoon, second part of this conference. And just finally, I'd just like to thank everyone who's contributed this morning, um, whether they're chairing a session or providing uh, a brief talk or involved in the panel discussion. Thank you very much for doing that. And thank you very much to the sponsors who've made this possible. Because remember, uh, Cambridge Global Health Partnerships is a charity and the work is done uh, from that perspective. So thank you very much to our sponsors. Thank you very much to uh, the team at Cambridge Global Health Partnerships who've helped put this on and uh, we look forward to seeing you again on the 19th of November. So hopefully that's just about 12 o'clock to <laughs> let everyone go back to uh, fighting Covid or whatever else you're doing. So thank you very much everyone and um, see you on the 19th. <laughs>